So tonight I want to talk about uh, Essex County on the eve of the American Revolution. Um, there's a lot of history relative to Essex County that is um, overlooked by historians. Uh, Essex County uh, played a tremendous role throughout the American Revolution, uh, whether it was at the start during uh, the battles of Lexington and Concord, or whether it was during the privateer operations later in the war. Uh, this particular lecture, just to give a complete disclaimer, just to get out of the gate, uh, this is an overview of uh, Essex's role during the build-up to the battles of Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill in 1775. Each of the topics that I'm getting into, I could actually cover in an entire lecture. Um, I would also like to point out towards the end, I will take as many questions as you guys would like. Uh, I love answering questions. Uh, the one thing I would uh, ask is just, if you do speak, just be a little loud just because I'm hard of hearing. So what we're going to cover tonight, already I'm having technical difficulties. There we go. Okay. What we're going to cover tonight is we're going to first start off with just an overview of the British Empire in 1763 to set the stage for what the cause of the American Revolution was. From there, we will talk about the Stamp Act crisis. We will talk about what is happening in Boston. And then we'll talk about what is happening uh, in Essex County. We'll talk about the Townsend Acts that took place uh, in the late 1760s. Uh, we are going to go on a little bit of a segue. We'll talk briefly about the treatment of Essex County loyalists during the build-up to the American Revolution. We will get briefly into the Boston Massacre. We will talk about the Tea Act and its consequences about what took place in the various areas around the county relative to the Tea Act. I'm going to be very excited to talk about Essex County prepares for war and the rise of the Minutemen. There is a lot of information I'm going to try and put in uh, that many people do not know about that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. I will get into the Salem Fair. Obviously, we're in Salem, so I have to cover that. If not, you guys will chase me to my car. We will get into the Battles of Lexington and Concord, and I will be focusing on three communities uh, and their response to the uh, Battles of Lexington and Concord. I will talk about this phenomenon that is known as the Ipswich Fright um, that should get a lot more attention and really doesn't. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to talk about the Merrimack Valley's role in the Battle of, the Bun of, Battle of Bunker Hill. Now, whenever I give a presentation, which I go back up here, all right. So whenever I give a presentation, I like to start off with an inspirational quote. And so this particular one, I don't have problems with these clickers there. Tech people. <laughs> this is where I do my interpretive dance just to let you guys <laughs> Any assistance on that? Do I say next slide? Or we're going along the next I just love the ten. I just love the tension I'm building up to my quote. <laughs> it's going to be an amazing quote, trust me. You go home, you'll tell your children about it, you'll tell your grandchildren about it. There we go, thank you. I always try to start off with a very sarcastic and funny quote. So, uh, starting off here, we have a quote for the Muppets, which I'll let you read, and then I'll pick up from that. <laughs> trust me, indigestion will be better than me. Okay. Let's uh, start off with the state of the British Empire in 1763, because this is where everything really starts off. Uh, England and her colonies in 1763, the origins of the war can be traced back to the end of the French and Indian War. Uh, following the conquest of Canada, uh, England began to recognize, okay, we won. <laughs> now, now what happens? And they realized that it was a very expensive proposition for them. Uh, in the months following the Treaty of Paris, uh, Great Britain was forced not just to administer its new territories, but to defend them as well. Uh, that, that required maintaining a 10,000-man army in North America. Uh, from future French operations, even though the French had been conquered, there was still the risk of potential French raids. And there was uh, Native American uprisings, such as Pontiac's Rebellion, which uh, started in 1763. 
By January 5th of 1763, Britain's debt was 122 million pounds. That's for 1763. With an annual interest of 4 million pounds. A year later, the debt had, uh, was almost 7 million larger. And by January of 1767, it had increased yet another 7 million pounds. So as a result, England is really in the hole right now. So to curb this financial burden, England basically took a step back and said, hey, who benefited most from our operations in North America during the French and Indian War that we should be looking at to help pay this bill? And what they did, they realized, was the people who benefited the most were the American colonies. After reviewing Britain's finances, George Grenville concluded that the American colonies had been benefited tremendously as a result of the protection of the crown, but at the same time paid very little in taxes. Basically, England saying, hey, those American colonies, freeloaders. He also pointed out that there was this active smuggling operation that was taking place, particularly in New England. And combined with massive government mismanagement, uh, particularly in the New England region, it resulted uh, in a loss of 6,000 pounds per year in just custom duties alone. So as a result, he began to make suggestions that, hey, we should do a direct tax on the American colonies to generate additional revenue and cut down this debt. So we'll start off with the Stamp and Sugar Acts. So the first two revenue measures that Grenville proposed on our American colonies, the first was the Sugar Act of 1764 and the Stamp Act of 1765. The Sugar Act essentially established tariffs on colonial goods and also attempted to cut back on American, particularly New England, smuggling with sugar and molasses from the West Indies by placing a three pence per gallon tax on foreign molasses. Now, I have quizzes throughout this entire lecture, so whether or not you guys stay for the entire lecture depends upon how you do on the quiz. <laughs> what is sugar and molasses usually converted into? Rum. Thank you. <laughs> the, also, the act also established a list of enumerated goods that could only be shipped to England. So in other words, they were cutting out America. Uh, that included lumber, uh, and it set forth procedures for accounting, loading, and unloading of cargo in American ports. Um, violations of this particular uh, laws was uh, prosecuted in a vice admiralty court, not a traditional civil or criminal uh, court from England. So you had two violations right away uh, from the American perspective of violating civil rights. First of all, uh, the right to a jury trial was not available in admiralty court. Secondly, uh, there was a presumption of guilt rather than innocence. The second revenue, and perhaps the more famous one, is the Stamp Act. Uh, which levied an unprecedented direct tax on every piece of public paper in the colonies. Newspapers, almanacs, deeds, custom documents, even playing cards <gasps> were among the papers subject to the tax. Now, in true government fashion, the Stamp Act even put required a stamp on tax receipts. God bless government. Um, the result was the American colonies, particularly in the New England area, were not happy at all. Uh, this was a direct threat to their smuggling operations and a direct threat to their economic way of life. So what you actually started to see within the urban areas of New England, you started to see an explosion of riots, you started to see boycotts and protests. Violence broke out in Newport, Providence, uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and Plymouth. But let's talk about Boston. Uh, on August 14, 1765, Bostonians stuck together and hung an effigy of Andrew Oliver. Andrew Oliver was the appointed stamp tax distributor from Massachusetts. And of course, it was hung from a liberty tree by the Sons of Liberty. Uh, two weeks later, a larger mob assembled and descended upon the homes of several individuals suspected of favoring the Stamp Act including that of the Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson. Uh, Hutchinson managed to get his family out when the mob arrived at his home, uh, but he actually gave a pretty graphic description of how the mob treated him. Uh, he described them as the hellish crew fell upon my house with the rage of devils 
in a moment with axes split down the door and entered. I was obliged to retire through yards and gardens to a house more remote where I remained until four o'clock, by which time one of the best finished houses in the province had nothing remaining but bare walls and floors. So how did Essex County respond to the Stamp Act? Well, for first of all, the Essex County response, surprisingly, the riots of Boston and the other urban communities actually horrified most interior residents. Residents that you would find within the agricultural areas away from the ports actually w w were turned off by the violence. And what most of the Essex County communities actually chose was an economic boycott and a form of public protest. For example, throughout this entire lecture, I tried to get at least one reference to most of the Essex County towns, uh, but it seems most of the towns I was looking at were Salem, Newburyport, Abel, Bradford, and, and Andover. So I do apologize if I missed your town. Uh, but in Salem, merchants banded together with others to resolve, we the inhabitants of said Salem, being fully convinced that an act lately passed by Parliament of Great Britain, commonly called the Stamp Act, would have carried into execution be excessively grievous and burdensome to the inhabitants of His Majesty's loyal province. So here we have again a, a, a civil political protest that's taking place in Essex. Haverhill released their own resolution that said, we declare that we think the Stamp Act to be unconstitutional, which is really wild that when you start looking very early on by 1765, you're starting to see Essex County residents actually invoke English civil liberties as a violation. So what you see in Haverhill is we think the Stamp Act to be unconstitutional which with the extensive power lately granted to the courts of admiralty are great infringements upon our rights and privileges and that they unjustly obtain by reason of wrong information. Andover declared that the sundry acts, especially by an act commonly called the Stamp Act, we are in danger of not only being reduced to such indigent circumstances as will render us unable to manifest our loyalty to the crown of Britain, but being deprived of some of our most valuable privileges which by charter and loyalty we have always thought and still think ourselves justly entitled to. Here is an example where, they, again, they are relying upon and asserting their English liberties. Okay, Newburyport. The best way I can describe Newburyport is anytime Boston did something, Newburyport's response was, hold my beer and watch us do something better. <laughs> and this is no exception. In late September of 1765, Newburyport passed a similar resolution uh, to the ones I just gave you, uh, where they said the late act is very grievous uh, and that they were facing, um, you know, basically um, facing uh, violations of civil rights. And they even went as far as say, hey, if you are accepting a position in Newburyport as a stamp collector or as a stamp distributor, you're an enemy of the country. And so what happened was, is apparently an unknown Newburyport resident uh, disregarded the town's warning and went, eh, economic opportunity, I'm going to take the job. <laughs> he accepted the appointment as stamp distributor uh, for the Merrimack Valley Seaport. And as a result, angry mob get together and said, watch us, Boston. <laughs> the crowd immediately started a campaign uh, against a stamp distributor. And according to an account, a 19th century account in Newburyport, the effigy of a Mr. I-B, don't know who he is, uh, who had accepted the office of stamp distributor, was suspended September 25th and 26th from a large elm tree which stood in Mr. Jonathan Greenleaf's yard at the foot of King Street, which is now Federal Street. Uh, a collection of tar barrels were set on fire. The rope cut and the image dropped into the flames. Ooh. This is like an 80s rocks concert for me. I am sorry to see a substitute, said a distinguished citizen of Newburyport. I wish it had been the original. Wow. It gets better. Because what happened next was, oops, I got so excited I bounced. Okay. Not satisfied with the message that happened, the mob then basically said, we are going to go about town and start questioning everybody. And what they did is they armed themselves with clubs, and uh, they started questioning strangers and residents alike. According to the period account, companies uh, of men armed with clubs were accustomed to parade the streets of Newbury and Newburyport at night, and every man they met, they put the question, stamp or no stamp? You have a 50-50 shot of getting the right answer. 
<laughs> the consequences of the affirmative reply were anything but pleasant. So we have two gentlemen in the account that says how they responded. One guy, the poor guy just shows up in Newburyport, was seized by the mob at the foot of the green, a foot of Green Street, and uh, not knowing what answer, stood silent. You'd think maybe they would have let him go, oh no, oh no. Uh, as the mob allowed no neutrals and silence was basically the equivalent of an admission, he was severely beaten. Well, as a result, another guy basically fared better. They cornered him and asked him the same question, and what a brilliant man, he said, I'm the same as you guys. <laughs> the crowd's like, yes, he's one of us, they let him go and applaud it. And he just departed in peace. Newburyport, ladies and gentlemen, that will be the theme for tonight. Well, about a year later, the Stamp Act was uh, actually repealed as a result of economic boycotts. Um, but one particular provision remained as a result of the Act, and that was called the Declaratory Act. Uh, the Declaratory Act from Parliament basically said, hey, we reserve the right to pass any future laws to, relative to the governing of the uh, American colonies. And they did. They jumped ahead with what was called the Townsend Acts. So right now, by 1767, England is still in debt. Okay. Um, they were looking at a projected annual cost of 400,000 pounds just to maintain their English army in North America in 1767. So Charles Townsend, uh, who was another government official, according to period accounts, his mouth often outran his mind. <laughs> I'm shocked he's in politics. <laughs> Suddenly announced he knew how to tax the American colonies. The Townsend Acts, as they became known, uh, provided for an American import tax on paper, painter's lead, glass, and tea. Uh, they also tightened um, custom policies and uh, revived the hated admiralty courts. Um, there were a minority of representatives from the House of Commons who absolutely opposed uh, this provision. Uh, the majority basically said, hey, it's going to raise a lot of money and also kind of punish the American colonies for their bad behavior, and at the same time allow Parliament to exercise uh, their rights as a legislative body. Well, these politicians were so pleased with themselves and patted themselves on the back um, that they said, hey, we're going to make so much money off the American colonies, we're going to start cutting back on English taxes in England. Uh, and as a result, they reduced uh, land taxes from four shillings on the pound to three, which immediately caused a loss of 500,000 pounds and an economic recession. Great job, guys. So once again, Boston says um, they stood at the forefront of the opposition. And on October 28th, 1767, the citizens resolved at a town meeting to oppose the acts by refusing the import of British goods and to encourage American manufacturing instead. However, uh, by 1768, Boston had basically resorting to mob violence again to get their point across. Um, the victims of the mob begged uh, then-Governor Andrew uh, Bernard, excuse me, Governor Bar Bernard, to apply for military protection uh, so the Townsend Acts could be enforced. So you have right now the rise of some loyalists who are basically saying, hey, can we get some more military in here to protect us? Um, he struggled with the decision, but ultimately the governor did apply for troops. Um, even more troublesome, by 1768, Bernard basically was ordered to dissolve the Massachusetts legislature and two full regiments of British soldiers were dispatched to Boston to protect custom officials and enforce the Townsend Acts. Now, the use of British troops um, in, um, in the American colonies this early on, now the, the purpose was they were sending in British troops for a policing action. They were being used for, to, as a police force. But from American residents, particularly New England, they saw this yet again as another violation of their civil rights. Um, Essex County was pretty teed off with anger and dismay uh, as a result, and they believed that this was an escalation of hostilities by Governor Bernard. Uh, initially, uh, the Massachusetts General Court framed a petition basically asking Parliament to have the uh, act repealed. Ninety-two representatives of the General Court signed it in favor, uh, 17 against. Two of them were from Essex County. Yes. Um, of the 17, one was from Salem, uh, the other was from Iswich. And um, yeah, their towns weren't happy. Uh, they were absolutely furious about it. And as a result, uh, the two representatives from Salem and Iswich were censured uh, and pressured to resign. 
Um, Topsfield. Uh, offered, <coughs> I, I love Topsfield on this one. They offered basically, hey, rioters, um, you know, we will offer financial assistance to you because I'm sure you were injured in the rioting somehow. Uh, so they actually offered financial compensation to support any of the Boston uh, uh, residents. And there was this big movement up until the American Revolution and even during the Siege of Boston where Essex County was constantly having either uh, provisional supplies sent to the Boston residents or trying to raise money. Or when they fled during the Siege of Boston, they would actually take them in uh, to their homes. The town of Bradford. Now, the town of Bradford is now part of Haverhill, Massachusetts. Uh, it declared it would oppose and prevent the levying or collecting of money uh, from us not granted by ourselves or our legal representatives. So at this point, they're pointing to the Massachusetts House saying, hey, these are the people who have the authority to tax us. Yeah, Haverhill, this one was wild. Haverhill actually had a debate in 1768 whether basically the militia should mobilize to Boston and try and stop the uh, British soldiers when they landed. Um, but here's a real weird thing, and you're going to see this a couple of times I'm going to reference, Amesbury. Now, I live in Merrimack, Massachusetts, uh, which then was part of Amesbury. Amesbury sort of took a hands-off approach up until the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And Amesbury and Methuen, which they don't border each other, but they're relatively close to each other, basically simply refused. We're not getting involved. We've got our own little home issues. We have to focus with the cows and the chickens and the minister's drunk again or whatever it may be. They just had their own internal, and, and you see actually, I was reviewing in preparation for this lecture, um, I see an account for Amesbury where this is big debate, and they are saying we've got bigger problems at home that we have to deal with than this nonsense down in Boston. They took a hands-off approach uh, to it. So as a result, at some point, Townsend, uh, the Townsend Act, Essex County moves for a boycott. I'm boycotting the lecture right now. <laughs> There we go. So while many of the residents of Massachusetts, uh, including um, Boston, were resorting to violence, threats, uh, and vandalism, uh, most communities uh, went back to what uh, effectively worked during the Stamp Act, and that was boycotts uh, and non-importation of English goods. And so what you start seeing between 1768 all the way up to about 1772 uh, is this non-importation movement uh, where basically they are attempting to boycott uh, English goods for coming in. And most of the towns uh, made various resolutions. Ipswich is, this first resolution I took from Ipswich came from 1770. Um, it basically they declared, they focused on tea. Uh, and they said, taking under consideration the uh, distressed state of trade by reason of the late act of parliament imposing duties on tea, voted, will abstain from ourselves and recommend the disuse of it with our family. So they are focusing on a boycott of tea. Uh, in Newburyport, they behaved themselves this time. Uh, after passing its own non-importation non agreement, Newburyport gave thanks to the merchants and others of Boston for the patriotic resolution of non-importation of goods from Great Britain. Marblehead. Uh, Marblehead quickly moved to stifle opposition to any non-importation agreement and bitterly denounced any dissent. If you are not in favor, if you're not with us, you were basically uh, in favor of um, the chains of uh, slavery. Uh, they refer to it as blindly preferring the chains of slavery to our most valuable inheritance, English liberty, English civil rights. Always remember, if you ever see the phrase English liberty, they are referencing their English civil rights. They're invoking their constitutional rights. Newbury was kind of a wild one. I like this one. Uh, 50 citizens from Newbury petitioned the town. And they basically said, you know something? We should create a list. Let's create a list of all the citizens who are on our side. Okay, and we'll publish it and say, you are required to sign this list. And then they basically said, if anybody refuses, we're going to know at that particular time who are enemies to the town, who are enemies of liberty of their country, uh, and that back they, they're going to regret it. Okay, so basically at this point, uh, Newberry is advocating for a blacklist. They want to know who within their town uh, is in support of this uh, non-importation agreement and who um, from uh, is not, so they can maintain a list and keep a watch over you. Which leads to the next thing. I have beautiful hair in this picture. <laughs> it is awesome. Let's talk about the loyalists uh, during this time, because this is where you start seeing the rise 
of uh, the violation of civil rights of loyalists. Uh, it usually starts uh, popping up now from the around the Townsend Act all the way up leading up to the American Revolution. So a little background about the loyalists. Um, the colonists uh, who eventually became Tories were not distinguishable from their neighbors, friends, or family. Uh, many loyalists, the, the common theme is when you think of a loyalist, you think of somebody who's fairly well off. Okay, someone who's maybe a person of po position of power. Perhaps they're a, a, a very wealthy merchant. Um, and there were actually a lot of loyalists like that. Uh, they worked as merchants, doctors, lawyers, uh, or ministers or distillers. Um, however, uh, the study came out is actually a, a study was done probably about a decade ago where they looked at the loyalists who fled both New York and New England uh, and settled in Upper Canada uh, after the American Revolution. And they started to find that actually not all the loyalists were all these wealth of wealthy people they were portrayed to be. Uh, you had a small number who ran shops, who owned taverns, uh, and were considered artisans. Most of the colonists who came from New England who remained faithful to the crown actually came from the middle or lower classes of the American colonies. Uh, these loyalists neither had wealth or privilege. Uh, and one study came out for those loyalists who settled within the Ontario region, 90% of them identified simply as farmers. And most of them actually didn't have these massive tracts. They had small tracts of land, usually under 200 acres of land uh, per person. Um, the other thing is, over half of the loyalists, particularly those from Massachusetts, were foreign born. Uh, they were usually of uh, Scot uh, Scotch or Irish descent or English descent. Um, ultimately, Essex County loyalists were seen as enemies of the state. Uh, they were portrayed by their neighbors, friends, and families uh, as enemies. And as a result, if you are an enemy of the state, you must be treated with scorn and contempt. Um, Eventually, disagreements went to ridicule, and ridicules returned to violence, and violence became <coughs> deprivation of civil rights. In Marblehead, um, Robert King Hooper, he was nicknamed King Hooper because he was fantastically wealthy. He was probably the we one of the wealthiest um, individuals in Marblehead, and the Hooper Mansion still does stand today. Uh, he became the object of mob violence when he refused to cut his economic ties with England. A non-importation non agreement would devastate his business. It would probably put a lot of his employees, a lot of his sailors, a lot of his ships out of business. So he refused. So in response, a Marblehead mob basically started to harass him. He was forced to flee to one of his ships where he had to sleep in the hold on top of dried codfish. <laughs> until he could flee the town. And he went to Spain, and from Spain he went to England where he never returned. In Raleigh, this one was another one, uh, Jonathan Stickney Jr., uh, who was quite vocal uh, against the Patriot cause uh, and its leadership. He actually would, during uh, town meetings, chastise and belittle the selectmen. He treated them horribly. Um, so as a result, town officials went, okay, we can resolve this problem. Let's arrest them and toss them in the Ipswich jail. And that's what they did. And so here basically um, is a, a resolution from the Raleigh selectmen where they say to the keeper of the Ipswich jail, you are ordered to receive into your custody Jonathan Stickney Jr., who has been apprehended by the Committee of Inspection, Correspondence, and Safety of the town of Raleigh. So it happens that by the time of the Townsend Act, you start seeing towns creating these committees of correspondence where they're writing to each other you know, to show their support for the non-importation agreement. And many of these committees took on a much, much greater role than just simply correspondence. As you can see here, some, um, some exercised uh, authority to determine your guilt or innocence. And so what happened was, is uh, he uh, had the most an open and daring manner endeavored according to the utmost of his abilities to encourage and introduce discontent, sedition, and a spirit of disobedience to all lawful authority among people. And the amazing thing is that they don't just simply say, put him in the jail. They tell him, put him in solitary confinement. Uh, they tell him he's in close confinement in a room by himself, no pen, ink, or paper, so he can't write to anybody to get support. Um, he's not allowed to talk to anybody until the, basically the, uh, Raleigh said, okay, you can release him. So other 
examples of abuse that we came across. Mobs from Br uh, Bradford, Haverhill, and Salem, New Hampshire targeted Haverhill loyalist Richard Saltonstall. The Saltonstall family was, is a, if you're from the Merrimack Valley, this is a huge old English family that was pretty much in the Merrimack Valley since the outset. Uh, crowds marched to his homes armed with clubs. Uh, Saltonstall, I'll give him credit, opened the door, asked him, what do you want? Um, they told him, uh, you know, they wanted him to renounce his loyalties, which he refused. He indicated that he was under an oath to the crown, uh, and as a result, he had to carry out the duties that were charged to him. Surprisingly, the mob dispersed. That was really kind of a curveball that I saw that happen. However, it took a couple of years to organize. I said, where did we go wrong? Oh, we came with, with, with sticks. Let's get the militia. Let's march on his house. And basically, you had all the Haverhill militia regiments, uh, militia companies, march on his house. Um, and uh, basically, we're going to tell him that either you're going to renounce or we're going to arrest you. Uh, he hightailed out of there as quick as possible to the safety of Boston. Now, this is where we get really kind of crazy. Uh, in Salem, uh, in Salem, a local loyalist was accused of being an informant uh, for royal custom officials, and he was quickly arrested. Uh, afterwards, head, body, and limbs were covered with warm tar, and then a large quantity of feathers were applied to all parts, uh, which, by closely adhering to the tar, exhibited an odd figure. So tar and feathering is a very, very violent, very painful uh, form of punishment or torture uh, for their victims. Uh, it leaves scarring, it leaves in skin and muscle being removed as you try to get uh, uh, the tar off. It's just a painful, painful fate. Uh, because they thought this person was essentially an informant, um, what they said is uh, they then um, set him in a cart with a placard that said uh, informer uh, on his breast and then escorted him out of the town, uh, who warned him, you come back, it's going to get worse. Now, as I started earlier on in the lecture, I said, you know, when Salem and Boston say, okay, we're going to show some uh, violence, we're back to Newburyport. <laughs> Hold it there, beer. In early uh, September 1768, a Newburyport captain and smuggler named John Emery uh, arrived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, while on shore, he was arrested by a customs officer for violation of the royal revenue laws. He was a smuggler. Uh, word traveled back to Newburyport, um, and it was basically identified, hey, there were two informants that um, probably ratted out uh, Mr. Emery. They were a Joshua Vickery, who was a ship's carpenter, and a Francis Magno, uh, who was a Frenchman. Uh, they were both quickly identified uh, as the informants. Now, the Frenchman, lucky enough, basically said, I'm out of here, and he got out of there. However, on September 10th, 1768, a large mob armed themselves with clubs, weapon of choice, uh, and began to search for the two men. And according to a September 27th edition of the Essex Gazette, Vickery was uh, quickly found in the most riotous manner, assaulted in the King's Highway in Newburyport, seized and carried by force to the public stocks in said town, where he sat from 3 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, most of the time on the sharpest stone that could be found, which could put him in extreme pain, so much that he actually fainted. He was also, as he's being marched to the stocks, he's being pelted with vegetables, rocks, mud, everything. But new report said, you know, we started off at the stone, let's take it up a notch. When he regained conscious, they removed him from the stocks, at which point they basically put him into a cart, put a rope around his neck, and hands tied behind him, and proceeded to parade him about the town. And once again, he was pelted uh, with various objects, eggs, gravel, stones, and he was seriously injured. After which, they took him to a warehouse. Uh, and pretty much they uh, clapped him in irons, and then they left him there without any better clothing. And he, it, the room was so small, he was basically forced to curl up because he couldn't uh, stretch out. And they gave him the edge of a tar, a tar pot for his pillow. And basically the tar basically attached itself to his head, and as a result, some of his hair was torn up when he woke up in the morning. Not that he slept much. New report. Well, it still gets better. The next day, he was under guard. People tried to see him. His wife pleaded with officials, hey, could I please see my husband? Everyone was rebuffed but the wife. The wife was allowed to visit him briefly. 
Well, eventually they brought him in front of a committee, and that was on Monday. He was dragged out of the warehouse, and he was subjected to intense questioning. And you know what the committee concluded at the end of their questioning? We've got the wrong guy. <laughs> Based upon his questioning, they've determined that he wasn't an informant. Um, wrong place, wrong time. Um, and they did release him. They did tell him, hey, if you ever decide now, this is your warning. If you ever do this again, we're going to even get worse. The poor guy's like, you just tortured me and I had nothing to do with this. Vickery remained in Newburyport for about another decade or so. And, and then he moved up into New Hampshire and never spoke about this again. Don't know why, but he never did. So jumping forward, I, I'm going to assume everybody knows about the Boston Massacre. Uh, so very briefly... There was an incident in Boston um, where it ended up uh, soldiers from the 29th Regiment of Foot fired into a angry Bostonian mob. This was really a turning point uh, for the Massachusetts Bay Colony as well as Essex County. Um, this really um, uh, frightened the county. They saw this was a step closer to war. And now as we're going to see in a few minutes what the Essex County mindset was regarding war. The biggest thing I do see uh, on this time, I do not see much rioting taking place uh, in Newburyport, Salem, or other communities. Most of the residents seem to take this as, as a political and a religious event. I, I see many memorial services, many uh, services that are being run by Congregationalist churches, particularly in the anniversaries after May 5th. But there was something fun that I came across, and this will be quiz number two that we're going on here. Show of hands, who is familiar with Paul Revere's engraving of the Boston Massacre? Okay. You guys ever heard of Henry Pelham? A few. What about Jonathan Mulligan? Thank you, Bethany. So we're going to play a little game here. So what happened was, is there was an a, uh, engraver in Boston named Henry Pelham who actually engraved the original Boston Massacre painting. And in the tradition, which I often deal with my students, one person decided to help themselves to someone else's work. And this is the result. The Paul Revere engraving. So Revere actually ripped somebody off. <coughs> Meanwhile, up in Newburyport, we have a gentleman named Jonathan Mulligan who actually had ties to Lexington, Massachusetts. He was a clockmaker. He saw this as a fantastic opportunity. So as a result, you have Mr. Mulligan who's ripping off Mr. Revere. The tension's just killing me again. Trust me, it happened. There we go. So if you go back, on Monday when they were preparing me for this talk, I kept playing this left and right, and Catherine was ready to kill me. See? There's very, very little differences between the two engravings. Um, from what the Massachusetts Historical Society says, some differences are Revere refers to the uh, engraving as um, the 29th Regiment of Foot, where Mulligan refers to it as uh, Yee. 29th Regiment of Foot. <laughs> that will fool them. Um, there's some differences as in the number of pillars and windows. Um, if, if you look up above the soldiers firing, there's a porch. The number of pillars on there differs between the two. You know, oh. and some, uh, some people say the coloring is different, but I, I, I'm not really looking at that. But if you even look at even the summary down below, is almost identical word for word. I would have flunked both of them if they were in my class. So here we are now. We're going into 1773. At this particular point, um, the American colonies, particularly Massachusetts, sort of cooled a little bit. After the Boston Massacre, people started to calm down. Tempers were starting to, to cool off. Um, then what happened was, in 1763, Parliament passed the Tea Act to refinance the shaky economy of a British East India Company. Basically, this is an 18th century bailout. Okay. Do you ever hear the phrase, history repeats itself? <laughs> this is it. Okay. Um, what they basically did uh, was the uh, East India Company at this time derived 90% of its resources from tea. By 1772, as a result of severe mismanagement, I don't know why, uh, the company was in desperate need of a bailout. So who do you go when you're a big corporation and you need a bailout? The government. Uh, company directors went to Parliament for relief, um, in which as a result they passed the Tea Act. 
which uh, through the East India Company gave exclusive rights to ship tea to America without paying import duties and to sell it to designated agents. Now when it came to New England, New Englanders were not a fan of English tea. Okay, they were actually a fan of Dutch tea. Dutch tea was generally smuggled into the colony from non-British sources. So as a result, merchants like John Hancock, and there were other merchants throughout Essex County, who really would have taken a financial hit if, they, uh, if this tea act was enforced. Jump forward to November 29th, 1773. Uh, the tea ship, the Dartmouth, arrives at Griffin's Wharf in Boston. Three days later, the Beaver and the Eleanor arrive. All of them have tea. Um, Bostonians at this point, again, let's get the mob together, and demanded that Governor Hutchinson order the three ships back to England. Uh, December 16, 1773, the owner of the Dartmouth basically pleaded uh, with Hutchinson to let him return to England without unloading. Hutchinson refused. And at approximately 6 o'clock at that night, 150 um, men and boys disguised as Native Americans or Indians marched to the three ships, boarded them, and dumped 340 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. Surprisingly, England wasn't happy with what we did. Uh, in response, they adopted several harsh and restrictive measures to punish Massachusetts. Uh, March 31st, 1774, King George III signed the Boston Port Bill, uh, which intended to severely reprimand Boston for their action. The port was closed to all seagoing traffic, shut off until the damages for the destroyed tea were paid in full. Uh, the Massachusetts Provincial Charter of 1691, this is one of the other documents that's considered critical to English civil liberties and American civil liberties, was revoked. Uh, that was a huge uh, no-no. Uh, additional regiments were dispatched to Boston. Uh, and Major Thomas uh, Gage, re, uh, who at that time was the overall commander of Amer uh, British forces in North America, replaced Thomas Hutchison as governor. Thank you, Penny. Uh, Gage moved the seat of government from Boston to Salem. And of course his summer home was located in Danvers as well, where he would vacation in Danvers, because Danvers is such a lovely place to visit, they decided to go there. Um, and then the seat of uh, customs offices from Boston were moved to Plymouth. Uh, Governor's Council, which was considered the upper echelon of the Massachusetts legislature, was completely dissolved uh, and replaced with a non-elective mandamus council. Town meetings were prohibited, banned, without the governor's express uh, permission, and they did away with jury trials for everybody. This is a huge, huge deal. Now, how did Essex County respond to this? Well, Essex County was varied. Um, some communities passed very stern resolutions condemning what happened. Others burned tea. Um, there is a story, if you go to Newburyport, there's a plaque on one of the walls that says that Newburyport burned tea, I think, in January of 1774. There's some debate whether that actually happened or not. Um, you also have some limited instances of violence uh, lash, lashing out against uh, loyalists and crown officials. Lynn uh, was quite vocal in his protest of the Intolerable Act and declared uh, their abhorrence of every species of ty tyranny and oppression. Uh, Marblehead stepped up and said, if you are a loyalist, you are supporting this act. You support this act. You are an enemy of the community, unless you recant. Uh, if you do not recant, you will be shunned, and if something happens to you, sorry, but oh well. Uh, so Marblehead at this point is threatening lo loyalists. Um, Ipswich declared that if any person uh, shall have uh, so much effrontery or hardiness as to offer any tea to sail in this town in opposition to the general sentiments of the inhabitants, he shall be deemed an enemy to the town uh, and treated as his superlative meanness and baseness deserve. <laughs> wow, you're mean. This ended up triggering what was called the Essex Convention. The, the Essex Convention uh, took place uh, about a month before uh, the formal uh, gathering of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. Uh, and uh, delegates from all Essex County towns arrived on September 6, 1774 in Ipswich, Massachusetts to discuss this growing crisis. Uh, Jeremiah Lee of uh, Marblehead uh, was served as the convention's chairman, and they met for two days. Uh, resolutions were adopted by, uh, three main resolutions were adopted. And I will say, because I referenced it before, Amesbury kind of finally got off their butt and did attend this meeting also. 
uh, first of all, they agreed that all the communities in Essex County would stand unanimous against opposition against the, uh, uh, the uh, intolerable acts. Uh, secondly, they demanded the resignation of any officials holding office by royal appointment. Uh, and finally, they said, you know something? We need to dissolve the Massachusetts legislature and we need to form a provincial congress to ensure that um, the colony is protected. So with that, what is the mindset of Essex County in September of 1774? You've seen the Stamp Act, you've seen the Intolerable Act, you've seen the Boston Massacre, now this. Well, the common belief by 1774, it doesn't matter if it was Virginia or Essex County, Massachusetts, this was a common belief held by most colonists, was that an immoral British government had exhausted all its opportunities for plunder and profit in England, Ireland, and India, was now seeking a dispute with the American colonies as an excuse to enslave them and deprive them of their wealth and liberties. They are looking at this particular time what is happening in Ireland and what is happening in, in, in India, and they're saying, where next? Um, there is also this conspiratorial belief going behind there. Um, they believe that uh, these economic policies that were coming out of Parliament were being crafted by mysterious men, the Illuminati, um, who controlled Parliament and the King's ministers, and they were actually trying to invoke war with England. They're trying to provoke a war at this particular point. Um, what made it worse, October 5th of 1774, uh, the Massachusetts General Court met in Salem. Uh, General Thomas Gage, acting governor and overall commander of all British forces uh, in North America, attempted to shut down the meeting but failed. It was kind of embarrassing, but he failed. In response, the representatives basically voted to convert themselves into the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, which became the de facto governing body of the colony uh, in order to promote the true interests of His Majesty in the peace, welfare, and prosperity of the province. This is taking place, the formation of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress took place here in Salem. By October of 1775, uh, Massachusetts is now on a wartime footing. They basically are now fully convinced war is inevitable. So Massachusetts at this particular time prepares for war. Um, the first thing they did was Massachusetts Provincial Congress said, well, who's going to fight the war for us if we go to war? They looked at their uh, colony's militia. The militia system uh, was determined that they would serve as the colony's arm. The first thing they had to do so they could make this body of troops essentially be the, the starting point for a military is you've got to get rid of the loyalist officers. You have to strip from the militia every loyalist officer uh, there is. Um, as a result, militias were ordered to meet forthwith and hold elections, vote them out. Uh, and they uh, were chosen to uh, elect officers basically who were loyal to the Massachusetts cause. Um, Congress also realized that they needed to revitalize and strengthen the mili military, uh, the colony's military system. In 1774, the Massachusetts militia system was not in the best state. Uh, it was ragged. Uh, but you're going to see, not as ragged as you would think, but it was in tough shape. One of the very first things on October 26th of 1774 uh, that Massachusetts Provincial Congress did was they created a resolution, they passed a resolution, ordering the creation of Minuteman companies. Now Minuteman companies were not something new. Uh, this is something that actually went back to about King Philip's War, uh, where soldiers, uh, a certain number of soldiers for each militia company were actually required to uh, gather and form uh, at a, well, start off as an hour's notice and eventually cut down in time, uh, where they were to field uh, in response to an emergency. Massachusetts Provincial Congress went back on that practice and ordered the creation of Minute Companies. And here is the transcript of the creation of a Minuteman Company. Uh, the field officers so elected forthwith shall endeavor to enlist one quarter at the least of the number of the respective companies and form them into companies of 50 privates who shall equip and hold themselves in readiness on the shortest notice uh, to march to a place of rendezvous. And then they said, said companies are going to be organized into battalions, regiments, to consist of nine companies each. So let me give you a very 30-second summary of how the militia was organized in Massachusetts. Every town had at least one, at least one, Minuteman, I mean, militia company. Okay? 
If you were between the ages roughly of 16 and 60, although the evidence suggests it may have been closer to 55, but within that age range, you were part of the town's militia system. Now, you're going to see in a few minutes what you were required to field with. Minuteman Company, so each town would have a militia company, and then each district within the um, county would take all the various towns together and form a regiment made up of those town militia companies. So an example would be the 4th Essex. The 4th Essex was made up of the Merrimack Valley. So you had any uh, militia companies from Andover, uh, Bradford, Methuen, Salisbury, Amesbury, whatever, they were all pulled together into one militia regiment. The same for Minuteman companies. Once they created Minuteman companies in 1774, each town had at least one Minuteman company. And they too were pulled by district into, um, into a regiment. Quiz time. What do you think the average age was of Minutemen? 22. Pretty much on, about 18 to 22. I always use the analogy where I live in Merrimack and if there was an alarm where I'm 52 and my son is 22 and we live roughly about a half mile, three quarters of a mile to where the green was located, we all, my son and I gear up. Who do you think is going to get to the green first? <laughs> You're right, I'm stopping at Dunks on the way. I, I might hit you know, the town market, get the Boston Globe while well, he's already marching off. They were trying to recruit the much younger men for the Minute Company. So let's take a look at some of the things. Emphasis, once Massachusetts uh, realized that their forces were, um, they needed to be reorganized and re-equipped and retrained, uh, they actually passed a resolution saying two things. Number one, you are to start drilling for war. Minuteman and militia companies, you are to start organizing and start preparing for war, which means you are to drill. Secondly, you are to inspect your companies to make sure they are fully armed and equipped for war. Um, they created a committee of safety, which was the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, which is basically the trigger mechanism to dispatch these minute and militia companies in the event there was an emergency. And then finally, there's a committee of safety. Um, the committee of safety had a support group called the Committee of Supplies. The committee of Supplies uh, was responsible to provide logistical support for the militia and minute companies when they're in the field. If you think about it, it, it's amazing, even in the 18th century, they're setting up similar what you would see in the 19th, 20th centuries for support. So for some continued preparations, um, they also decided what do they want for arms and equipment. Initially, they looked at the militia laws. There were militia laws in Massachusetts that dictated how, when, Minutemen, when militia companies should field, what they should field with, who was excused, who wasn't excused, what the penalties were, etc. What the Massachusetts Provincial Congress did was they made a recommendation and this is the, the recommendation. And they basically are suggesting, hey, each town of militia and Minutemen, you should have at least a gun, a bayonet, a cartridge box to carry your ammunition in, a knapsack, uh, 30 rounds of cartridge and ball, minimum. But that was a recommendation, okay? There's actually a reason why the Provincial Congress only did a recommendation. It was to basically, if the poo hit the fan, they could at least say, hey, we're only making recommendations. This was not a declaration in defiance of England. It was sort of a safety measure. So what the towns did was say, okay, well, it's a recommendation. We're going to take over and make sure that our minute and militia companies are armed and equipped properly. We are going to take that recommendation and do a step further. So you start seeing all the various towns passing resolutions about what their minute men and militia men are going to carry when they go out into the field. And so here's some samples. All right, Amesbury. Always late to the party. <laughs> Amesbury initially voted not to form a Minuteman company. Wow. Um, at a town meeting in March, um, they, they voted not to form a Minuteman company. So what happens when you go to a town meeting and you don't like the outcome? You have another town meeting. You get all your friends together and you re-vote. And that's what Amesbury did. Two weeks later, they had a second meeting and created a Minuteman company. But Amesbury was kind of cheap. They basically said, listen, Minutemen from Amesbury, you're responsible for arming and equipping yourself. But other communities, the town of Danvers. Uh, Danvers passed a resolution on November 21st, 1774, that its minute companies would be equipped with an effective firearm, bayonet, pouch, knapsack, 30 rounds of cartridges, and balls. So they actually mimic the Massachusetts Provincial Co uh, Congress recommendation. In Andover, they focused on bayonets. Their main goal was to try and get as many bayonets into the hands of Massachusetts, uh, Andover Minutemen uh, as possible. So what they did was they said, we are going to collect all the bayonets in the town. Anybody who owns a bayonet, you're going to turn it over to us. 
And then what we will do is we will turn around, give it to the Minutemen in our town, and then uh, make sure they have enough. If they don't, we'll go find a place to buy them. Ipswich, this one's kind of neat because this is what's called a covenant. I actually found evidence in Essex County in at least three communities where there were what were called independent companies. Um, there were more, but at least so far I've documented three. Newburyport, Haverhill, and Ipswich. Uh, this is basically, Ipswich's minute company was actually independent of the town. Uh, it was basically, I don't call it a social organization, but basically rather than have a town resolution, this is part of what I would call their bylaws where they basically voted uh, that each of them would have an effective arm, bayonet, pouch, knapsack, 30 rounds of cartridges ready-made, uh, and they also promised to exercise and drill. Now before I get into the drill, a common question I am often asked, where did they get all of the arms and equipment? Um, they were actually making it in their towns. I've come across multiple, multiple documentation um, where, for example, if they wanted to have leather cartridge boxes made, they would go to the town saddler and they would hire him to make belting and cartridge boxes. Um, if they wanted to have fowling pieces, which were like 18th century shotguns modified to accept bayonets, they would go to the town carpenter. Uh, so there was definitely people who were making them. But there's also this belief, oh, when April 19th battles of Lexington and Concord took place, everybody just got up and ran to the fight. There was no order, the Minutemen were never drilled, the militiamen were never drilled, it was just a free for all. What I've actually found is that is the exact complete opposite, and this is one of the things I'm excited to share with you is something I found relative to Essex County. First of all, Andover was drilling quite often. Uh, they were drilling uh, the first said day of December, meet together and choose a person for leading or instructing. I shall appear to them in the most skillful in military discipline, and they'd be equipped with good guns. And we're going to get back to why they're talking about they want to hire somebody to drill. Amesbury said they would exercise four hours in a fortnight every two weeks. Uh, then they changed it, uh, they upped it to four hours every week. Uh, Methuen ordered their men to uh, drill, drawn out, and expose the train. Haverhill initially voted um, where they were going to break their militia companies down into squads. Three and a half days in a week, three hours each day. That is a lot of drilling taking place in Haverhill. Um, now, here's the really, really neat thing that I found. On March 14, 1775, uh, the town voted to raise $30 to hire a military instructor, a drill master, whatever you want to call him, to train the Minutemen. It was a gentleman named George Marsden. And for years, I always thought, well, George Marsden must be a veteran of the French and Indian Wars. They found this old guy um, who they hired. That was until I talked to a gentleman named Don Hagist, and Don Hagist is an expert on the British Army in uh, 18th century America. George Marsden is a British deserter from the 59th Regiment of Foot. Haverhill was actually, and I, I have newspaper accounts, Haverhill was a haven for British deserters. They would usually use Haverhill as a waypoint to get up into New Hampshire and get away. George Marsden was of the 59th Regiment of Foot. He was training every Minuteman and Militia Company in the Merrimack Valley of Essex County from Amesbury down to Andover. It's kind of wild. He's only one of two individuals I know of who were British soldiers who were training the uh, American forces. Now the thing is, did you just drill on the, the uh, town level? No, they actually got together. Neighboring communities got together and drilled together. And the big one I have here um, is just that they were drilling across county. You would have county level drills. You would have regional level drills. You would have neighboring communities get together to drill. Uh, evidence suggests that men and militia companies were constantly doing this. On April 13, 1775, Haverhill, Bradford, and Andover met in Andover with George Marsden to drill. According to the account, Captain Sawyer and 46 of his Haverhill Minutemen traveled west of Andover to hold a joint drill with Thomas Poor and his men. Um, According to an account, uh, the purpose was to meet at Andover for exercise, to drill. Now, as a little side note, Timothy Pickering and his drill. This, uh, Mr. Pickering, I do like Mr. Pickering. Unfortunately, he's going to get a bad rap in a few minutes. Um, but Mr. Pickering um, actually drafted his own drill. Uh, he was a Salem resident. He took a look at the Norfolk drill, which was from the 1750s. He kind of borrowed a lot from it. I'm not going to say plagiarism, but I am going to say plagiarism. But there were other things he instituted in there that were commonly used by militia. And he has fantastic and amazing re recommendations in there. 
He went to the Massachusetts Provincial Congress in the, in the fall of 1774, when the Massachusetts Provincial Congress was saying, hey, what should our minute and militia companies drill with? And he basically tried to promote his book. He gets an A for effort, but basically Massachusetts Provincial Congress said no. These, um, the Army of Massachusetts, the Grand Army of Massachusetts, is essentially going to adopt the same drill as the British Army. So George Marston had a perfect role when he was up in the Merrimack Valley. So Timothy Pickering, it, it, eventually his drill was adopted by, by the state of Massachusetts. I believe it was 1776, 1777, it was adopted by the state. But the first two years of the war, um, his book just kind of sat there. So let's talk about the Salem Affair. The Salem Fair was the result of uh, Thomas Gage's desire to locate and recover four pieces of brass cannon. There's an amazing book out there by John Bell. It's called The Road to Concord. It basically focuses on these four cannons. In the 18th century, um, brass cannons were actually considered weapons of mass destruction. They're highly mobile. They can cause a lot of damage. Uh, and they're easily uh, maneuverable on the field. Uh, September of 1774, Four of these cannons were stolen out of Boston and smuggled out of the town, right underneath Gage's nose. And this became an obsession for Gage. One of the reasons he marched on Concord is because there was a report that these cannons were in Concord. Mid uh, February 1775, he gets a report hey, we think those cannons may be in Salem. Uh, shortly thereafter, um, he learned from an informant uh, that field pieces were in an old store or barn uh, near the landing place in Salem. Uh, and they'd be removed in a few days. So he had to move quickly. So what he did, so what he did was is he ordered the uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Leslie uh, and his uh, 64th Regiment of Foot, which had 240 men, I apologize for the typo there, to sail from Castle William, which was one of the uh, British Army's uh, uh, barracks, and go to Marblehead to seize these cannons. The plan was um, they would seize them, uh, they would march through Marblehead, come into Salem, seize them, and go back out through Marblehead. This plan was just doomed to be failed from the beginning. That's the only thing I can say. <laughs> two o'clock in the afternoon. Who marches at two o'clock in the afternoon when everybody's watching you? But on February 26th, a Royal Navy vessel anchored off the coast of Marblehead. I mean, they should have just fired off their guns and said, hey, guys, we're here. Uh, since it was a Sunday, many locals attended afternoon religious services. Uh, the troops landed and then started a quick march towards Salem. Uh, of course, they were right away detected, uh, and news reached Colonel Mason, uh, the, a Colonel Mason, that troops were marching into the town to take possession of his guns. Uh, Mason then raced uh, towards uh, Foster's uh, black ship, uh, blacksmith shop. Uh, he stopped first at Salem's North Church and announced the regulars are coming after the guns. Many churchgoers assisted Mason uh, and Foster in either hiding or relocate, relocating the weapons. Afterwards, they raised the drawbridge that was between the mainland and the location where these guns were originally stored, thereby preventing the regulars from gaining access to the blacksmith shop. When the strike force arrived, uh, the Salem residents and the troops had this really nasty standoff. It's a stare-down contest. Uh, the colonel demands that the drawbridge be lowered. Uh, you know, in, in true Massachusetts fashion, I won't say it, they basically said no. Um, <laughs> In response, according again to historian uh, John Bell, uh, the colonel actually wondered aloud whether he should let his troops open fire on the civilians. Kind of an effort to try and intimidate uh, these, uh, this civilian crowd. Now, as a side note, this is what the 64th Regiment looked like. This is an actual period drawing uh, from the time of what a grenadier from the 64th Regiment of Foot uh, would have looked like at the time they marched out to the Salem Affair. Of course, some of the soldiers from the 64th tried to see some boats uh, moored in the North River and cross the canal. Uh, a couple of uh, Salem uh, residents purposely sunk them. There was a scuffle between British soldiers and another individual who got a scratch on his uh, breast, which basically, if you read some of the newspaper accounts later on, it was basically he was run through 12 times and somehow survived. Um, in fact, he had some phrase, I think he said he was the first scratch of liberty or, or something I remember reading on the 19th account. At the height of uh, this uh, conflict, what happens next is um, Mason loudly announced that the Essex County militias have mobilized. That word has gotten out throughout the entire community, throughout alarm riders, that they're converging on the town in mere hours. And they were. The, the Essex County uh, fully mobilized in responses, as did, as did Middlesex County. <coughs> um, 
violence seems this is it. It's going to be a, a, a fight. Tension. All it needs is one shot to go off, and everything is going to go to. At the last minute, a minister steps forward, a Thomas uh, Barnard, and he negotiates a compromise. You have to give this guy credit, okay? As tense as the situations are, he stopped the start of the American Revolution in February of 1775. Uh, aware that the cannons were long gone, he made a, a proposition. He basically said, listen, 64th Regiment of Foot and Colonel Leslie will lower the bridge and let you cross over, but you cannot march more than 30 yards beyond that. You're going to wheel around and then march away. The cur you won't search for the cannons. It sort of achieved his objective where he could march within the area where the cannons were believed to be found. He wouldn't find anything. And at the same time, it satisfied the, the residents of Salem. And it worked. Uh, they agreed, the 64th marched off, and then they made their way back to Marblehead empty-handed. The mission was a complete failure. But we're back to Newburyport. <laughs> this is my favorite story about the Salem affair, and this is just a, a snippet of the, um, of the newspaper account. Late afternoon, uh, February 26th, an alarm writer arrives in Newburyport uh, with news of the Salem affair. <clears throat> At the time of the Salem affair in Lexington and Concord, there are nine minute and militia and independent companies in Newburyport. You have four militia companies, two minuteman companies, an independent marines, independent artillery, and an independent, something called the independent company. They all mobilized and marched for Salem. Uh, it appears the men advanced as far as Raleigh, uh, where they received word, it's over. You can turn around and go back home. The Newburyport soldiers <laughs> turned around and stopped at the first tavern they found. <laughs> this is where it gets awesome. They raised their glasses to no less than 120 toasts. <laughs> and they proceeded to drink the tavern dry. For Rev 250, if there's anything we're going to do for celebration of the 250, this crowd and I, we're going to that tavern. And we're going to drink it dry. Um, <laughs> Newburyport stiffed the tavern owner, too. It, it took the tavern keep for two years to finally be paid. Um, I was able to see in a private collection uh, the petitions of this individual begging for uh, a payment of the rebuild. But 120 toasts, I want you to think about that. Okay, you were required to keep up. Okay, so from the account, I believe they slept overnight. It wasn't Uber back then. Okay, let's talk about Lexington and Concord. And I'm going to focus on three communities here. Um, again, just like the Boston Massacre and just like the Tea Party, I'm going to presume everybody knows about the battles of Lexington and Concord. Um, this, this was a very, very tough day for Essex County, as you're going to see. Uh, there's some things that, you know, might be a little humorous, there's other things that are really, really tragic uh, in this particular day. And I'm going to focus on three communities in their response to the battles of Lexington and Concord. Uh, I'll sprinkle in other things as we go along, but the first one is Andover. Uh, Andover Minutes companies uh, mobilized before 9 o'clock in the morning. They received word uh, from a Timothy Herrick, who was an alarm writer. Uh, and here is an account at April 19, 1775. Uh, the middlemen middle men, uh, were alarmed with news of the troops marching from Boston to Concord, at which news they marched very quick from Andover. They marched about five miles of Concord, then meeting with the news of the retreat from Boston again, which news we turned our course in order to catch them. This is very common that day. Minute and militia companies that are trying to catch up to the British are constantly adjusting their course of action and course of route to try and catch up with them. Andover was one of them. But here's the thing. Within five miles they were, they basically... They were in Bill Ricca, okay? And they were moving rapid enough that they could have intercepted the British column, probably in Lexington as it was retiring back from Concord. They stopped. And of course, the, the question is, why did they stop? Well, they were hungry. Here's an account from one of the Andover Minutemen where on April 19th, this morning about seven o'clock, we had an alarm that the regulars had gone to Concord we gathered at the meeting house and then started for Concord. We went through Tuxbury. Uh, and in Bill Ricker, we stopped at Pollard's to eat some biscuit and cheese on the, uh, on the common. <laughs> Great job, team. So Andover had an opportunity to intercept. I believe they probably would have a, a, an opportunity to intercept the column in Lexington. Uh, they, they missed the opportunity. Then we have Salem. Um, and, and this is a tough one. Um, Timothy Pickering uh, was in command, the same gentleman who was pushing his book was in command of a full militia regiment in the area of April 19th. 
Uh, after receiving word uh, of the fight in Lexington, he delayed mobilizing the troops. His excuses ranged from, maybe it's false news, we might want to confirm it before we go out, to, it's too late, we're in Salem, there is no way we're going to be intercept the column. Eventually, his men forced him to, uh, to go out. Um, as the regiment advanced towards Boston, similar to Andover, he uh, ordered them occasionally to take breaks or adjust their line of march. Later that day, uh, Pickering had a chance to attack the British troops near Medford, Massachusetts. It's actually Cambridge, uh, but chose not to do so. He could have hit them. Uh, Pickering would later argue, I halted them because General Heath discouraged me from engaging the troops. Um, he received a lot of criticism because his men were forced to watch from a nearby hill as the British troops marched into Charlestown in the protection of the Royal Navy. And Timothy got a lot of flack for this, uh, ranging from people who were criticizing him. There was, I, I see references, his father was perhaps an openly loyalist. Uh, he was indirectly accused of perhaps intentionally slowing his regiment to allow his, the Majesty's forces to escape. Now, in deference to Mr. Pickering, for the remainder of the war, he was brilliant. He was probably the best thing that ever happened to logistical operations of the Continental Army. So he did quickly redeem himself. And he had a very successful legal career and eventually became one of the first judges on the Massachusetts uh, courts after the American Revolution. But the community I want to focus on right now is Danvers. Um, Danvers was perhaps the hardest hit of the, the Essex County communities during the battles of Lexington and Concord. Now, there were three phases, I would call it, of, um, well, maybe more, but I'm going to break it down to phases. Um, apologies to Minuteman National Park. I know. Um, you had the Battle of Lexington and the Battle of Concord. Um, then you had the British retreat, so up to the point where they halted in Lexington and met Percy's reinforcements. Then they all marched to, uh, back towards Boston through Mononymy, which was a district of Cambridge, uh, what is now known today as Arlington. Just to set how ugly and brutal the fight was in Mononymy. It was, um, it resulted first in the highest American casualty rate, higher than the battles of Lexington and Concord combined. The best analogy I can give is if you've ever seen them, it's not the best analogy, but just to give a mindset, if you've ever seen or heard of Black Hawk Down, this is what the Mononymy fight was. It was house to house, room to room, door to door, hand to hand throughout the entire community. Um, and basically, according to British accounts, when they uh, retreated through Lexington and were approaching Mononymy, because they were adjoining communities, uh, the regulars were subjected to an incessant fire all around us. Uh, as they continued to approach Mononymy, this town was a perfect location for an ambush. All the homes, uh, first of all, the village road sloped downwards. All the homes were up against the road. Uh, and basically, they had barns and closed pastures. Minute and militia companies had ambush potential up the wazoo, and they took advantage of it. And as the British regulars are coming down that hill towards Mononymy, they can see what is going to be taking place. So what happened was, um, the British, recognizing this extremely dangerous situation, orders every one of the homes cleared. This is what leads to the door-to-door, house-to-house, room-to-room fight. Uh, and after they would clear the house of the enemy, they would try to burn it to the ground. One of the first units to incur the British wrath was Captain Gideon Foster's company from Danvers, uh, Massachusetts. Um, upon arrival, Foster positioned his men uh, along a stone wall flanking a hillside orchard uh, alongside Minutemen and militiamen from Lynn, Needham, and Dedham. So you have two Essex County company uh, units at this fight. Um, some of Foster's company took cover behind another wall uh, that was located across the uh, roadway at the Jason Russell House. Um, the sad thing is, unfortunately, as the British were in position, they never saw the 4th Regiment of Foot flanking them. So now, as a result, they were now trapped between two forces, the Light Infantry from the 4th Foot, who was coming up behind them, and the British soldiers on the road. They had no choice. They were basically forced into uh, the Jason Russell House. So you had men from Danvers, Lynn, and ne Needham, who made a mad dash uh, for the home. Uh, several militiamen were cut down uh, as they were trying to escape, including uh, 21 Pearly Putnam of Danvers. Um, the British soldiers pursued the militiamen into the house. Um, when they reached the first floor, they saw there were two militiamen there. Uh, one of them basically tried to leap through the window to escape and run out through the backyard. There were British soldiers waiting there for him 
uh, where they opened fire and killed him. Uh, the second followed and was wounded in the leg. He miraculously survived. But just to show you how crazy this firefight was, later accounts indicated the person who survived had no less than 32 bullet holes in his coat. This is the fight that they're going through right now in Monotony. Um, they then moved up to the second floor, and they went down to the cellar and the attic. Hand-to-hand -hand combat with men from Lynn and men from Danvers with the British Army. Uh, many of the regulars, it, it came down to the bayonet. Uh, Captain Foster would later assert that three or four of his men surrendered only to be butchered with savage barbarity. 19-year-old uh, Minuteman Dennis Wallace attempted to surrender, uh, but fled when he realized they were going to execute him. Uh, he was shot several times, but managed somehow to survive. You look so good, Henry. It's just, there's sexy and then there's Henry sexy. Um, I'll make this content. I, 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 am, I, I intentionally I was going to say something nice about the Danvers alarm list, which I will do in just a second. By the time the fighting around the uh, Russell House was over, 11 men were dead. That's just out of that one house of the, of the monotony fight. And Danvers suffered the greatest loss. Seven men killed, one wounded, one captured. They had the second highest casualty rate for the battles of Lexington and Concord. Only Captain John Parker's Lexington Company had a higher casualty rate that day. Um, I did write down, I wanted to make a note for myself just to at least give you an idea about the Essex County other units that engaged that day. Uh, Lynn suffered six casualties for that particular day. Salem had one killed. Uh, Beverly had uh, three uh, that were uh, killed or wounded. With Danvers uh, casualties, that came up to 20 casualties for the battles of Lexington and Concord came from Essex County. That is 22% of the total American casualties for that particular day. Now, before I go on, I lost my clicker. Look, I'm already falling apart. I do want to put a plug. This is obviously the Danvers Alarm List. Um, if you are looking for an Essex County group that absolutely honors the American Revolution and highlights the Essex County sacrifice, that is a group that you absolutely should check out. Uh, I can't say enough nice things about them. They're not threatening me over on the third row. <laughs> they, they, I consider them very good friends, and they're a very good organization. Um, they're, they're very nice people, and they truly do honor Danvers' sacrifice uh, during uh, Lexington and Concord. So if you're looking, say, hey, I wonder if there's a living history organization I could check out in Essex County, I would highly recommend them. I'd also recommend Glover's Marblehead Regiment as well, but I am going to you know, do a shout-out uh, to, uh, to Henry, because otherwise he'll follow me home. <laughs> this is a really neat document that I found. Um, this, is in a, uh, this is tied to the New York Public Library. This is one of the very few um, written orders that I'm aware of. I'm not sure, Jim, if you're aware of other written orders from, uh, from the day. But this is a written order uh, to Captain John Currier of the Amesbury Militia from Isaac Merrill, selectman in Amesbury, ordering him, because an alarm writer came into town and said, hey, you need to mobilize. There's been a fight in Lexington. The British are marching towards Concord. You need to mobilize the Amesbury Militia. This is the order to assemble and mobilize the Amesbury Militia. Now, there's two things. One, this, this is a document that was written on April 19, 1775. So, you know, you have witness houses, you have witness accounts, you have a witness document. How it got into the New York Public Library, I have no idea. I'm going to assume a New York Yankee stole it or something, but it's, it's in there. But the only thing, I kind of was joking when I was sharing this at a lecture I did on uh, last Sunday. I think by the time he finished writing, he probably could have, you know, shouted out his window or something to say, hey, what's going on? But it's really a neat document that I would, um, you know, it's available. Um, if you, I'm going to give you my contact information. Uh, if you're interested to see what aims for the orders were, just email me, and I'll, give you, I'll send you the transcript uh, at no charge. Um, I do want to summarize with Lexington before we get to the final comments I want to make in my final slides with the Ipswich fight and the Battle of Bunker Hill. This is an account from Andover, uh, Andover's James Stevens, a Minuteman. I'm going to apologize for Mr. Stevens. His spelling is atrocious. But he describes passing through Lexington after the battle. Now keep in mind, they halted for lunch. By the time they're coming through, they're now seeing the aftermath of the battle. Andover never engaged the British on this particular day. Um, when they went through, um, as you can see, they reference how they stopped the Pollards. Um, we went through Bedford. We came into Lexington. Uh, we, met, we went to the meeting house. Now, meeting houses in 18th century New England were also churches. So they were horrified to see that there was a cannonball that had gone through the meeting house. That was from Percy's reinforcements earlier in the day. 
Uh, they saw several dead regulars on the road. They saw some of their own fellow militiamen dead. They saw horses uh, dead, houses burned, cattle destroyed. Um, they were absolutely horrified uh, at what they saw that particular day, just to see the level of carnage. And one of the things that's unfortunate is if you take, when you read accounts from the 19th century about it, particularly those after the, the American Civil War, they tend to water down the violence because they're coming out of the aftermath of the American Civil War. This was a brutal, brutal, ugly day. And this is what the end of uh, Minutemen saw. I want to talk briefly about what is called the Ipswich Fright. This impacted Cape Ann, the Salem area, Beverly, and the Merrimack Valley. Um, what happened in the days after Lexington and Concord um, was a panic set in throughout Essex County. It's known as the Ipswich Fright. It was a, a wild phenomenon uh, where it led to the mass abandonment of communities uh, in the evacuation of the North Shore of Merrimack Valley into New Hampshire. What it basically started is they said on April 21st, 1775, a rumor started somewhere within the Ipswich vicinity that a Royal Navy cutter had anchored off the mouth of the Ipswich River. It actually did. There is an account that the Royal Navy did anchor a cutter. However, the rumor began to spread that the British regulars had landed and they were laying waste to the community in revenge for Lexington and Concord. Um, with most of Essex County militia at the siege of Boston, uh, a massive panic set in because there's nobody to defend. And as a result, the rumor then began to spread to other towns. It went south towards Beverly. It started heading west and north, uh, northwest towards the Merrimack Valley and the North Shore. A few hours later, the rumor reached Newburyport. There's an account where somebody rides in and interrupts a meeting with a minister to announce that the British are marching towards Plum Island to uh, burn everything in their way. In the Merrimack Valley, uh, particularly in Newburyport, Amesbury, Haverhill, Bradford, and Methuen, they overwhelmed the ferries trying to escape from the belief that these British soldiers were, were coming. Uh, at the same time, you have soldiers, Minutemen and militia coming down from New Hampshire and Maine. So basically the ferries became clogged uh, as a result, and that just exacerbates the situation even further. Oh yeah, let me back up for a second. And here, what I call Mother of the Year. So I'll let you read it for a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Newberry Point, at least. This is an account I came across where supposedly the, the woman had fled with a cat on this. I always love telling that story. If I had done that, my wife would have murdered me. She's five feet and can take me, but that's a different thing. Uh, residents of the North Parish of Andover, North Andover today, uh, actually fled when they got word uh, of the British supposedly marching into the Merrimack Valley, they fled into a woodlot known as Den Rock, which is now in Lawrence, Massachusetts today, and remained there for at least a day. Uh, in Newburyport, the houses at Turkey Hill uh, were filled with women and children who spent the night in great trepidation. Um, one Raleigh man yoked up his oxen and took his family uh, and fled. He also grabbed neighborhood children to escape the regulars. There was actually almost a borderline fistfight in Newberry where there was an argument between some of the locals whether or not to tear up the bridge uh, over, uh, uh, over the river uh, so they could prevent the march from Ipswich towards Newberry Port. Oops, what happened? Wow. Now I'm just giving away the rest of my... Uh... Come on. All right, well, one of the things, uh, there was one slide I talked about. There was um, a gentleman, there was an account from Gloucester, and the account from Gloucester was a father and his family uh, basically um, were trying to sail to Rams Island to escape the belief that the British were coming. The children were crying, the children were scared. You know, they had already found out about what happened in Lexington and Concord, and now the British believed to be coming to their home. The father turned to his wife and basically said, keep those kids quiet or I'm gonna throw them overboard. Father of the year. Um, meanwhile, all the residents from Merrimack Valley and, and, and North Shore are fleeing into New Hampshire, particularly that it seems to be at Exeter, New Hampshire, seems to be the epicenter where a lot of them are fleeing to. And there are accounts of communities such as uh, Newburyport, Salisbury, Amesbury that are completely run out, empty. Well, eventually, Exeter, the residents of Exeter are saying, you know, something is just not right here. You know, we haven't seen any accounts of British fleets off of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, 
We're not hearing any accounts of any engagement. Something's not right. So as a result, they sent their own writer into Massachusetts to see where the British were. Um, eventually, it came back. This is all fake news. So <laughs> there was no British army that landed in Ipswich. It was a massive panic. Um, but I will say this. It scared the bejesus out of Essex County and Massachusetts. Shortly after this, the Massachusetts Provincial Congress and eventually the Massachusetts Legislature passed resolutions relative to Essex County. Because I would say in a, in a future talk, I would say, hey, Essex County has got so much coastline. The British could hit any community along that coastline they wanted to. And there are accounts of British scouting some of those communities. Um, they actually passed um, resolutions in law for Essex County that if the British did attack, what the steps were necessary for Essex County residents to evacuate from the area. It was almost very remin uh, it, it was almost a predecessor of the 9/11 post 9/11 preparations. What you were seeing uh, for Essex County. The last thing I'm going to talk about very very quickly is the Battle of Bunker Hill. I'm going to again assume that everybody knows about the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, the reason I bring that up is that Essex County men uh, who were all trained by that British regiment uh, deserter were inside the redoubt. If you ever ask about the uh, battles of Bunker Hill. The first regiment you always think about is Prescott's battalion, or you think of Stark at the rail fence. That's because they wrote their stories later and promoted what happened. But you forget about James Fry's battalion. James Fry's battalion was made up of um, Merrimack Valley men, and they were in the redoubt uh, for that particular day. Uh, the fight was absolutely a brutal, brutal fight. I'm not sure if anyone's aware, the British Army suffered almost 50% casualty rate that day. That's how nasty this fight was. It was just a brutal, nasty fight. Um, fighting within the uh, redoubt were the uh, Merrimack Valley men, men from Andover, men from Bradford, Methuen, Amesbury. The total casualties uh, for the Fry's Regiment for that particular battle um, was 46 casualties. 46 men from the Merrimack Valley section of Essex County were killed or wounded that day. You had 15 who were killed and 31 wounded. If you think about that, as well as the casualties that were suffering during Lexington and Concord. Uh, Essex County really took a heavy, heavy hit uh, those particular days. Essex County was involved in other operations during the Siege of Boston. They were predominantly involved in um, uh, interdiction, foraging interdictions, where they would attempt to starve out the British through privateer fleets as well as military operations. But that is a talk for another day. So with that, we can stay here all night. My wife has four. I will take any questions you may have. Yes, sir. So, um, how did Marston fare? How did who? How did Marston fare at the Battle of Bunker Hill? Because he was facing the 59th and the 59th. Yes. yes. Marston is interesting because he eventually, after his service with Essex County, and he was in Fry's Battalion, he eventually worked his way up into Maine. And he eventually became an adjutant to a Maine regiment. I think it was the 11th Massachusetts. Don't hold me to it. But he eventually did move up to uh, uh, Maine. Eventually, he, I think he retired from service after the war somewhere around the rank, around captain. Um, but he continued to serve the American cause after, uh, after Lexington Concord. So, other I questions? heard a, a request to have the question repeated. Oh, sure. The um, question was, what happened to George Marsden, the British deserter, after Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill? Uh, he was never captured. Uh, he was never apprehended. He ended up moving to Maine, uh, where he enlisted in a a Maine Province Continental uh, Regiment, and um, he uh, continued to serve out for the remainder of the war, and I believe he retired at the end of the war around the rank of a captain. Other questions? We have a microphone, please use yeah. it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Take, the, uh, the wait, wait, of take the microphone so we can hear you. Right there. Oh, right right there. Cool. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. This is your time to shine. The charter of 1691, that was not the original charter. No. That was the charter that came after they kicked Edmund Andros. Yep. And when James II, the reprobate, advocated and called the Glorious Revolution because yep. there was no fight. And if anybody wonders about the time, if you've seen William and Mary furniture, that's from that time. It, now, that, that point of time, they, 
Did they, they be, that's not, that's the one they tried to go back after Andros and they wouldn't give them the original charter. I'm mm -hmm. verifying that I've got that information correct. And what they did is they gave them a new charter. They also learned that Plymouth didn't have a charter because they never signed any paperwork and they did the Plymouth contact. <coughs> and then they got, they got the same one we got. Yes? I'm going to defer to the 17th century experts yep. in the room, but I will say this, just to supplement. Most of what you're saying, I, I am familiar with. Uh, it wasn't just the 1691. The 1691 was basically, for, from an 18th century perspective, your modern codification of their rights. But you did have a lot of English law going even back to, to way back uh, in, into 14th, 13th, that eventually graduated through court decisions, legal decisions, legislators decisions. Um, you're absolutely right, the charter was revoked uh, when they created the Dominion of New England. Um, but um, as for, you know, from the colonists' perspective in 1775, the 1691 was the most recent codification of their rights, which is why they look back at that one. Thank you. Hey, no problem. Uh, gentlemen back there, I got three. Charles, can get back here? A gentleman back in the corner, I think, straight over there with a glass of Uh, just a little clarification on, on um, Tim Pickering's role in defense of Tim. Um, the, the actual, he gave orders to, I think it was Captain Foster, um, who was actually served as part of his regiment, but it wasn't really Dan, it's now Peabody. So it was the yes. South Danvers Parish yes. that actually took the heavy casualties. And he gave orders and some of his troops did make it and he died. Unfortunately, the rest of the gang didn't get together quickly enough and, and did. Actually, there's, there's multiple accounts of this. There's some very good documentation, but he was actually pretty much court-martialed for it and exonerated. So all the evidence indicated that he did what he could on that day. I, I do agree, which is why I said he kind of got a bad rap that day. Good. I just, I just wanted to. I'm glad you did. I absolutely do. I have to defend him. You know, the thing is, this, this, from my perspective, when you look at Lexington and Concord, they tend to be very Middlesex County centric on the history. And so Essex kind of gets pushed to the side and Timothy Pickering just gets reduced down to a couple of lines. If you, t if you take a look, for example, David Hackett Fisher's book on Paul Revere's ride, right, Pickering's only mentioned twice. There's only two sentences about him. One has nothing to do about Lexington and Concord. The other one does. Uh, so you're absolutely right. That's one of the reasons where they were sent early, why Salem had casualties that particular day, because there was some Salem men that came along as well to the market. So absolutely, you're 100% right. And, and the fact that he got a bad rap just shows, again, it, it, it comes down to how everything was presented, and it was presented wrong. So there's a gentleman over this way, I think. Uh, right. How long did Mr. Stickney stay in solitary? <laughs> how long did Mr. Stickney stay in solitary? You guys got lucky I had a microphone this time. Yeah. <laughs> how long did Mr. Stickney stay in solitary? Long enough to flee eventually to Boston, and then eventually flee from the area. Um, I do recall coming across his loyalist claim uh, after the war, uh, where he relocated out of the out of the country. The average stay for the loyalists when they were in custody usually ranged from a couple of days to extended periods of time. Usually, what they would do is they would try and exert pressure on their um, um, on their families to try and basically recant or pressure their husbands or sons to recant. Uh, if that didn't work, then they would start applying pressure to the females within the family, the women, the children, and, and so forth, to get them to sort of switch. But what I generally see with uh, Massachusetts loyalists, including Stickney, so basically, I'm not sure exactly how long he stayed. He was in for a bit. But what, um, what I do see is generally, once they are released, um, they generally try to make it to Boston or try to get out of the area. Now, interesting footnote I am going to put. Uh, there were many, many Salem loyalists who fled Massachusetts at the beginning of the war, they were actually welcomed back after the revolution. Uh, they, they were came back. Uh, they actually formed sort of a loyalist society after the war, which I was like, you really want to do that? But it, again, it's an uh, example of how they tried to build relations after the fight. I believe Mr. Lane was next with a question. I'm just, I, I'm curious, I've seen some of the rosters from April 19th, and I think Ipswich had a troop of horse is that a dream, hope, aspiration, or a real thing? I have seen references to it. I haven't seen actual documentation, but I am aware 
leading up to the American Revolution, Essex County definitely had at least one troop of horse, maybe two. From what I can gather, one of them was definitely out of Ipswich. I have, in speaking with a gentleman named Bill Rose, I know you're familiar with him, he's a historian uh, located in Middlesex County. He and I have talked about trying to find the famous Ipswich troop. Uh, we just haven't been able to locate it, but I have found indirect references to Ipswich uh, 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 Company of Horse. If I find it, it will be on my blog, absolutely. Do you, do you mean the muster roll? Well, I haven't found the muster roll yet. Oh, I can send it. Wait, is it from the American Revolution? It's from, uh, yeah, it's from the Massachusetts State Archives. I would gladly like to take a look at that because I've been searching for that for quite some time. And the last time I went down there, Mr. Hannigan hid it from me. Oh, I got it. So, other questions? So at the end of the day, on April 19th, what was the verdict? Uh, folks, if we could please uh, speak the questions into the microphone just for the benefit of okay. anyone in the auditorium who might be hard of hearing. At the end of the day, on April 19th, what was the British body count? I'm going to defer to Mr. Jim Hollis there. I did look at this before I pulled into the parking lot. Minuteman National Park. Hi, yeah, the, uh, the British um, suffered 73 killed, 174 wounded, and 26 missing. Yeah. That I, I looked at it before I came in, but I knew there was no way I was going to write it down. And I knew Jim was going to be here, so I had to make him earn his keep. Other questions? Okay. Well, guys, if uh, before I wrap up, if you ever want to contact me, here is my contact information. Uh, my my website slash blog is called Historical Nerdery. Um, it actually focuses on 18th century Lexington, Concord, and the Merrimack Valley in Essex County. Uh, it covers loyalists, uh, anything relative to Lexington and Concord. Um, I do have on there multiple resources. Uh, if you want to help yourself, they're all free of charge. I never charge for the information. It has uh, various accounts on Merrimack Valley Minutemen, uh, it has accounts on the Ipswich Fright, if you help yourself to it. Uh, from that website, you can hit my blog, and you can also hit my podcast as well. I get recorded my third season. I've only got two seasons right now. I was slacking. If you want to get a copy of this presentation, you can email me at my email address, mcalpin77 at gmail.com. Don't be a stranger. I would gladly love to share the information with you. And if there's nothing else, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think this is also, we also had a tape tonight with uh, Bev Cam and uh, Salem Access. So uh, they'll be putting it up, uh, and then I think we'll also try to promote it. So if you want to see it or share it with your friends, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.